What up dudes and welcome to another biology podcast. Once again this is delivered to you from the master of disaster, Monsieur Clay. And without further ado, let's get into some learning about gene linkage. So as you can see on your screen we've got some success criteria there for you. Bit of a new thing for the podcast. And there's four criteria there for us to look at today. So by the end of this podcast, or by the end of watching it and thinking about it for a little while, maybe doing some reading, I'm hoping you can define the term linked genes, explain Mendel's law of segregation, identify gene interactions where genes are linked, so you'd be able to actually look at, say for example, a Punnett square and the phenotype and genotype ratios, and actually identify that there's a linked gene interaction present. And you'll also be able to explain why phenotype ratios are different because genes are linked. But before we do anything else, we need to have a quick sort of memory uh, recap, I guess, on basic inheritance and dihybrid crosses. So I'm going to go right back to old Gregor Mendel, the Austrian monk, and have a bit of a chat about what he found out. A couple of definitions before we start off, really. We'll look at, first of all, this idea of the P1 generation. And basically, that's where you take two purebred individuals and you cross them with one another. So on the screen there, you can see we've got just hypothetical alleles there, A's and B's. We've got a pure breeding homozygous for A, homozygous for the big B, big A, so AA, uh, sorry, big AA, big BB. And we've crossed that with homozygous small AA with small BB. Now you notice because we're dealing with purebreds there, each of those individuals can only actually make one type of gamete. So the parent on the left there, big A, big A, big B, big B, can only make a big A and a big B gamete. That's the only combination of those two alleles that it can do. And the same for the other parent there. Now when we cross those two members of the P1 generation, so we cross the big A, big A, big B, big B, with a little A, little A, little A, sorry, little B, little B, we get the offspring, we call them the F1 generation. And all those offspring are heterozygous for both of the alleles. So they're basically big A, little A, big B, little B. Now those guys can make four different types of gametes, as is shown on the screen there. So they can make the big A, the big B, the big A, the little B, the little A, the big B, and both little A, A and little B. So hopefully that's all clear for me, and you can remember that from previous work we've done on this. So then what Mendel did was he actually then crossed the F1 individuals with one another. So he did a A, sorry, big A, little A, big B, little B, and he crossed it with the same genotypes and basically ended up producing offspring that followed a ratio that we all be familiar with. So just have a quick think, see if you can remember. Here it should be 9, 3, 3, 1. And as shown on the screen there, we've basically got nine genotypes produced from the F1 cross that are dominant for both characteristics, three that are dominant for one and recessive for the other, three that are dominant for one and recessive for the other one, but the opposite way around, and then one that's recessive for both. If any of this is going a bit quick for you, pause it here, go back, watch it all again, just get this bit into your head straight away. So on your screens right there, you'll be able to see that we've got a 9331 ratio there that's going on. We can see we've got about 88 dominant dominance, 33 recessive, uh, dominant recessive one way, 28 the other way, and 11 the other way. So they basically loosely fit that 9331 model that we'd expect from a usual dihybrid cross. Unfortunately, though, what we're doing today doesn't fit that nice 9331 model, um, and we need to know why. So that's what we're going to be learning about right now. So I'm going to give you a bit of an example, and it's on your screens right now. An example we're going to look at is within fruit flies. And we're looking at two genes within fruit flies, one that codes for body color. Um, big B, dominant, is gray. Small b, recessive, is black. And the other gene is for wing length, where we've got big V, victor, is normal. And small v is short wings. Now, when we do an F1 cross with these guys, so the F1 cross, remember, is heterozygous for both the traits. As you can see on the screen right now, we've done a a heterozygous cross, an F1 cross, um, this time the ratios are a little bit different. So we've no longer got a 9331 ratio. And that obviously leaves us with the question that's just appeared, why? And I want you to pause it for a second, see if you can have a think about what might be causing this. Okay, so you might have given it some thought and you've been thinking about ratios before when we've been talking about gene interactions. And you might have been thinking about epistatic genes, and those sort of things, and you'd be wrong, because that is a different interaction, and the ratios would be very different to what you're seeing on your screens there. 
Now the reason that these ratios are so different is because the genes that we're talking about for both wing type and for body color are actually linked genes. Now the definition is on your screen right now, but just to sort of tell you what linked gene is, two linked genes are genes that code for very different things obviously, two different genes, but they are located on the same chromosome. So for example, let's say we're talking about this, these fruit fly genes that we're saying are linked. The gene for body color and the gene for wing length are both located on the same chromosome. Now that's different to genes that aren't linked because if they were not linked genes, if those, those genes for body color and wing length, length weren't linked, then you might have one on chromosome number one, for say for example body color, and the gene for wing length will be on chromosome number three. Now whether a gene is actually linked or not has quite a big impact on the way that it's inherited. And talking about inheritance usually brings us back to this guy, the Australian monk Gregor Mendel. And Mendel's law of segregation is really important to this, which is just appearing on your screen right now. Now basically, Mendel's law of segregation stated that allele pairs separate during meiosis. And if you remember when we do that thing when we do our Punnett squares and we work out the gametes, so for example what gametes can big A, little a, big B, little B make, we're actually carrying out the law of segregation, we're mixing things up in, all, in the ways that basically Mendel said could happen. And usually with genes that aren't linked that would work absolutely fine. However, it doesn't work so well when we're talking about um, genes that are linked. And the reason for this is, if we actually think about it, usually they're located on different chromosomes, so inheritance can mean that you can get one or the other of the allele in the sperm or the egg that's produced. Stop and have a bit of a think about that, maybe jot a few diagrams down, post a question on the wiki or whatever, if that's sort of tricky for you to understand. The basic thing is though, is that you actually, if you look at the screen right now, you can see those two chromosomes. Basically linked genes are genes where, say for example looking at the big A and the big B there, they're not always separated from one another. So if you inherit the big A, chances are you're also going to inherit the big B. That means when we look at our genotype and phenotype ratios that most of the offspring inherit the big A and the big B or the little a and the little b. There are a lot fewer offspring that involve inheritance of say for example a big A and a little b or a big B and a little a. That mixing up or recombinations just doesn't happen so often with linked genes. Now it still happens sometimes when crossing over happens but not as often as it would to if the two alleles, or sorry, the two genes were located on different chromosomes. And when the genes aren't linked, we'll get that 9331 ratio pretty much every time. Unless there's some sort of epistatic interaction going on or something like that. But because with linked genes, that recombination of the, the two genes that's going on due to crossing over, because that only happens every now and again, we get sort of a different sort of ratio where we've got sort of two of those possible phenotypes or genotypes that are quite common and the other two that are not so common at all. And you can see that there in the data on the screen right now. So you can see the majority of the offspring have the same genotype as the parents, which is common in genes that are linked. So we can see we've got a grey normal offspring, uh, sorry, grey normal parent and a black short parent, that's what we started off with, and we end up with lots of black short parents, lots of grey normal parents. The majority of the, the, the offspring, 176, have the same genotype as the parents. However, those recombinants, are those ones that are sort of made of a mixture of the two parents, the grey and the short, the black and the normal, well, there's only 24 of them, so they're a lot less frequent. Obviously, as we can see again, not fit in that 9331 model that we're used to with dihybrid crosses. Now the number of those recombinants, that 24 we're just talking about, actually gives us quite a lot of information. And the smaller the number of recombinants, the closer the genes are actually on the chromosome. And what I mean by that is if we've got a low number of recombinants, we say that the two genes that are linked are situated really, really close together on the chromosome. Where if the number of recombinants is higher, we say that those genes are further apart. Have a quick think, see if you can figure out why. Maybe pause me. Well, think of it this way. If the genes are really, really close together, crossing over isn't going to be able to segregate those two genes very easily or very often. So there's a low number of recombinants that are actually occurring. Whereas if the genes are located far apart, crossing over is likely to segregate them more often, so you will have more recombinants. Anyway guys, that's a fast podcast, the success criteria on the screen again. Have a think about it, have some time to have a look at it, read the books, page 62, 63 of Pathfinder are really good.
questions on the wiki, questions in class.